Now to Ukraine, where the United States is trying to influence the protests that have been seen on the streets in that country over the last month. Senator John McCain went on one of his famous or infamous diplomatic missions, this time to Kiev, where he met with opposition leaders and protesters and pushed for closer ties with the European Union. McCain, whether the State Department likes it or not, has become a maverick ambassador to the world in recent years, though often with not so satisfactory results. As Abby Olheiser points out this week in The Wire, when John McCain comes to town talking freedom, disaster ensues. Most recently, McCain was in Cairo in August following the Egyptian military coup. Since then, protests have continued in that country as well as violent crackdowns. And now the former democratically elected president, Mohamed Morsi, is facing terrorism charges that could result in his execution. Also, McCain visited Syria back in May, where he met with rebels and became the biggest supporter of arming the opposition in the Syrian civil war. Since then, that opposition has been routed, and far more radical elements of the opposition are exerting more and more control and initiating violence within the ranks. McCain also met with rebels in Libya back in April of 2011. Specifically, he met with them in Benghazi, and we all know what happened there later. So it seems like wherever McCain goes, the situation deteriorates, which doesn't bode well for Ukraine. And one has to wonder how a senator like John McCain has garnered such respect in the Senate when it comes to foreign policy. Today, the United States is nearing a nuclear deal with Iran, but just a few years ago, this was Senator McCain's solution to the situation in Iran. In that old, uh, that old Beach Boy song, Bomb Iran, you know. <laughs> Bomb, 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 bomb. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, I think Iran is a great threat. Uh, the Iranians are continuing their efforts to acquire a nuclear weapon. McCain was also one of the many voices who thought the war in Iraq would be a cakewalk. It wasn't. He also thought the later troop surge in Iraq that he supported was responsible for a drop-off in violence. It wasn't. Instead, it was the Sunni awakening, which happened several months before the surge. And as most U.S. troops have left Iraq today, McCain in 2008 was calling for a much longer occupation of that country. President Bush has talked about our staying in Iraq for 50 years. Maybe 100. Is, uh, is that how long? Is we've, that, been in, we've been in South Korea. We've been in Japan for 60 years. We've been in South Korea for 50 years or so. That'd be fine with me. So so the question is, why is John McCain's interventionist foreign policy, which is subscribed to by many elected lawmakers, still taken seriously? Joining me now is to answer that is J.D. Tuchili, Managing Editor at Reason 24-7. J.D., welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. So uh, pretty simple. Is John McCain the foreign policy kiss of death? Yeah, I would say pretty much so. I mean, uh, if nothing else... He goes into a country, he opens his mouth, and he gives uh, local authoritarian regimes great cover to, uh, to say they're local nationalists. Uh, look, I'm being leaned on by the U.S. Uh, you know, this is what's happening. You know, obviously, we don't want to go in McCain's direction. Uh, even when he's right by accident, um, he does it in the wrong way. He's a bull in a china shop. So he does enormous damage, I think, around the world. Well, McCain isn't the only one who sort of subscribes to this belief. Uh, Lindsey Graham is with him on a lot of these issues. And Connecticut's Democratic Senator Chris Murphy went with McCain to Ukraine this week. Uh, how is this hyper-interventionist ideology still legitimized despite its disastrous effects that we've seen over the last several years? Because more than anything, it plays to the local TV audience. I mean, it plays to the media in the United States. I'm, I'm not even sure that it's intended to have an, an effect on the international stage. Uh, and certainly it's counterproductive in many cases on the international stage. However, it makes headlines. Uh, you and I are talking about him. And that gets the politicians in front of the camera. It gets them into newsprint. And that may be the uh, end goal for uh, at least a couple of these, uh, these guys anyway. When it comes to Ukraine specifically, McCain has aligned himself with an opposition party and a leader that has some questionable nationalist, anti-Semitic past, he, he just basically is stepping into a complicated situation here. What's he hoping to accomplish? You know, that's a great question. I mean, right now, you've got a, a three-way trade struggle going on. Ukraine is caught in the middle. Uh, the government there has a lot of problems. It's also in an unenviable situation. And the people in the streets have very legitimate demands. But when an American politician steps into a situation like that and starts throwing his weight around, 
He gives he gives the local government some cover to resist the Americans. I mean, it, it helps pull up some national uh, fervor, uh, nationalist fervor, and it's a. Uh, it complicates the actual argument taking place in that country. It doesn't do anybody any favors. They have a problem there that has to be resolved locally. It's not something that John McCain is going to fix. We nearly went to war with Syria a few months back. The president came very close to launching military strikes, something that McCain and company have been calling for for more than a year now. Does that suggest that despite the rhetoric coming from uh, President Obama about diplomacy and the importance of diplomacy, that this White House is a lot closer to McCain's interventionist thinking than it lets on? Well, yeah, well, we've had continuous foreign policy continuity, I would say, at least since 2000. Now, there's no particular reason to draw a bright line between Bush administration foreign policy and Obama administration foreign policy. There's fine tuning. There's a difference in, uh, in detail and emphasis. But the, uh, the, the fundamental premises are the same. It's an interventionist foreign policy. It's militaristic. And it's one that sees um, its, its goals as being one with troops um, or these days with drones. The president right now is pushing back against criticism he's received from the interventionist far right on this potential for an Iranian nuclear deal. But this deal wouldn't have been possible had the president gone through with military strikes in Syria. Isn't that right? Well, um, I'm not sure what kind of a deal is going to, is going to come out of this, but these discussions have been ongoing for years. Are, are regimes uh, capable of being brought to the table with threats? Of course they are. Does that mean that you're achieving your end goals uh, with threats, that the people on the ground, the people in the streets are better off at the end of the day because uh, you've threatened, you've uh, shipped weapons? That, I think, is more complicated. Um, you know, we look at these international conferences um, and whether the, the pressure is brought by interventionists of the right and the left, because this tends to be a, a shared fetish. Uh, the end result tends to be something that hits the headlines with politicians meeting, but the people who actually suffer are, tend to be a little more anonymous, and those are the people on the, in the streets and on the ground. J.D., if a decade of war that we've seen increasing uh, extremism, so we've, had, we've gone on this war on terror for more than 10 years, and as a result, we've seen an increase in extremism, uh, the, the loss of huge amounts of treasure, the amount of money we've thrown into this war on terror and intervention, if all of this isn't enough to stop the interventionist when they go out there and, and call for us to go into another country, then what will? What will it take for people like John McCain and Lindsey Graham to see error in their ways? Uh, pushing them aside, uh, there's no way that people who have who have based their careers on uh, this type of policy, this kind of goal, are going to renounce it. Decided that it's or, or rarely are they going to renounce it. Decided that they've been in error for decades. Uh, they're going to be pushed aside. We have spent a vast amount of money. We uh, spend currently somewhere around the uh, 40 percent of total military spending on the planet comes from this country. And yes, extremism has risen uh, has risen around the world. We have not achieved a safer planet. Uh, I would say the foreign policy that we've been pursuing has failed. They're not going to admit that, though. You know, we need to put, sweep them aside and put different people in place to implement a different foreign policy. J.D. Tuchili, Managing Editor at Reason 24-7. Thank you. Thank you.